And sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I to the light I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken No, oh, I won't be shaken but My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Standing on 
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. was built on I am safe with you I'm gonna make it through David went through when my house was built on you I am safe with you I'm gonna
my shepherd and he is everything I need so I will not worry I will not fear the enemy he said that he loves me he said that he's with me even though I walk through the valley of shadow and death and still I know he has good plans. He has good plans for me. So I will take heart in deserts and gardens. He has good plans. He has good plans for me. If I know my Father, I know my Father has. my Savior, so why should I doubt my victory? Oh, why would I question the rod and the staff that comforts me? He quiets the waters, he quiets the storm inside of me, so what could be better than walking with him? If I know my father, I know my father. 
perfect son of God in all his innocence here walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief a man of sorrow son of suffering oh blood and tears how can it be there's a God who weeps there's a God who bleeds oh praise the one who would reach for me hallelujah to the son of suffering so distant and removed but you chased us down in merciful pursuit to the sinner you were grace and the broken you embraced and in the end the proof is in your wounds yes in the end the proof is in your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus. Glory to God in heaven, your blood 
still speaking your love, still reaching all praise. King Jesus, glory to God forever. Glory to God forever. Glory to God.
continuing in our verse-by-verse study of John chapter 6, and we've titled this series, The Bread from Heaven. And last week we saw that Jesus was preparing his disciples for the miracle that he was going to perform in the feeding of the 5,000. And we saw that he asked a question to engage his disciples, and he specifically asked Philip the question. He says, where can we get bread to feed all these people? And Philip's answer may have surprised us. And the answer wasn't what I personally would have been expecting in reading the, this story here. But he gives a, a response of like, dude, we, there's just no way we can do it. One takeaway that I have from that is that we can walk with Jesus for many, many years. We can see Jesus doing the miraculous in our lives. We've all experienced God's miraculous touch in some situation, and yet we can still have doubt when a certain situation comes up in our lives. It's important to remember something. When I was being discipled by my pastor, I asked him one day, I said, when, when will I ever stop doubting? And he said, not until you see Jesus face to face. As long as we live in this fleshly tent, this fleshly body, doubt will be there. But one day, that doubt will be gone when we see Jesus fully and when we're transformed into what we should be and what we were always designed to be. So I want to start out with a question for you this morning. Have you ever been in a situation where the help of another made a difference? Maybe you ran out of gas. Like, now you can just get on your phone and call AAA or whatever, but, you know, there was times when I would run out of gas, and, man, I'd have to walk. Like, I remember one time I was driving up from Southern California when I was living there, and I was driving up to, my, uh, to see my mom. And I'm, I just get over the grapevine, and I, I cruise through the what we would call the button willow stop there on I- I-5, and... I get about five or six miles out, and my car runs out of gas. So my car, the gas gauge didn't, didn't work. And so I would always kind of, you know, try to figure out how many miles I went and all that. I just totally forgot. And so, man, I didn't have a cell phone back then. I had to get out of my car, and I had to go and walk all the way back to Buttonwell. So I walked back five miles, buy a gas can, put gas in it, And I start walking back. So I'm walking down I-5, man, and cars are just driving by, and I got a gas can in my hand. And finally, somebody pulls over and says, hey, dude, do you want a ride? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right? Man, I was so happy for that guy, man. I gave him a $20 bill for giving me a ride and stuff. He's like, no, I don't want your money, man. And so I just got out the car, left it on the seat. But I was so thankful that this dude I didn't even know just came by and picked me up and gave me a ride. Man, maybe uh, you were in an emergency situation and, and you needed to get somewhere and you were able to call somebody and say, hey, man, I need some help. Maybe you needed help lifting a heavy item, right? And thank goodness that person was there to help you lift that heavy item. Listen, it's great when you have somebody who can come alongside of you and help. And today we're going to look at somebody in this story that we're fixated on in John, somebody who's going to try to give assistance to his brother. The title of today's message is The Help of Another. Would you please stand as we read the Word of God if you're able to? It reads, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Lord, help us this morning to peer into this verse and draw out some things that we need to see, things that we need to see in our own lives, Lord. And we pray, Holy Spirit, as always, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and that our hearts would be receptive. We ask this humbly now in the mighty name of Jesus and all the church said, Amen. Please be seated. So if you remember last week, 
Philip had replied that they did not have the resources to feed this multitude. And we saw that it was a far cry from what his response should have been. As we mentioned last week, Philip had been with Jesus for several years. He had seen the miracles that Jesus had performed. And and yet, his answer did not reflect what what he had seen. Remember, he said, even if we worked for months, we would not have enough money to feed them. Philip, for whatever reason, could not get his mind around the fact that with Jesus, anything was possible. And then Andrew steps in. Nothing like a friend to come and bail you out of a situation, right? You ever had that friend who just sees like, You've just said the wrong thing, and they jump in to try to help you out, man, so you don't look so bad. Well, Andrew was this type of person for Philip, I believe. And what I want to do this morning is I want to look at the similarities between Philip and Andrew. And there's two specific similarities that I want to draw out in this verse. Here's the first one. Both Philip and Andrew... Bring others to Christ. Well, how do you see that in that verse, Pastor? Well, let me tell you how. If you go back to verses 8 and 9, it says, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. So Philip gives his answer to Jesus, and Andrew immediately jumps in. And here's what he says. He says, look. Here's this young boy. He presents this young boy to Jesus. And it appears that Andrew is in the business of introducing people to Jesus. The first time we see this is with his brother Peter. If you go to John chapter 1, verse 40, it reads this. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who had heard what John said. And then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus, and looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. So we see in this passage of Scripture here that Andrew hears John. What John? John the Baptist, as he's saying, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he hears this message that that Jesus is the one, and he begins to follow Jesus. But what is his first thought? Man, i got to introduce my brother to this guy. So he goes to his brother Peter and says, dude, this is it. This is the man. This is the one. It is the Christ, the Messiah. And he brings his brother to Jesus. Now he sees this young boy, and he does the same thing. Lord, look. Here's this boy. Here's this boy, Jesus. Such a beautiful heart that Andrew has of bringing others into the presence of the Lord. The thing is, is that Philip has this very same mindset. If you go back to John chapter 1, starting in verse 43, the very next verse, it says, Then the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. So they're back in Galilee. And finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. So they are all from the same area. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Joseph. So Philip has the same heart. He has the same mindset. He meets Jesus. Now he wants to tell somebody else about Jesus. And so he goes and finds Nathanael. I love this portion of Scripture here because it's a great reminder to us 
of what we are to be doing. We're to be introducing people to Jesus. That's our job. That's our job. It's our commission. And I tell you guys this all the time. But I want to go back and I want to read Matthew chapter 28 to remind us of what we should be doing. If you go to verse 16, it says, Then then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. See, even some doubted then. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our job, church, is to introduce people to Jesus. That's our job, man. That's job one. If there was a job description for being a Christian, it's introducing people to Christ. But I'm going to tell you something, man. We are closet Christians. We do not want people to know we follow Jesus. We're afraid of what they, others might say. We're afraid of the backlash. But we cannot be afraid, church. We must live our lives as Christ has designed us. We have been designed as his children to be his ambassadors and his representatives. And our job is to introduce people to Jesus. Yes, some people are not going to be receptive. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, look, not, everybody, not everybody's going to come and run to Christ, but we have, an op- we have the opportunities presented to us to share Jesus with others. We cannot let fear keep us from sharing the hope. Because, man, I know there's going to be that moment when I'm standing before the Lord and I'm going to see the list of people that are not there Because I chose to be afraid. Some of you have family members that desperately need Jesus, but you will not speak to them about it because you're too afraid of what they're going to say. Or you're too afraid of them pushing you away. But how much worse is it for them to be eternally away from God? We cannot worry, church, about what others think. Our message is a message of hope, and every human being on this earth needs to hear it and receive it. Now, the cool thing about Philip and Andrew is the fact that before Jesus even said this to his disciples before he ascended to heaven, these two guys were doing it, man. They were out there, and they were introducing people to Jesus. They didn't have to be told to do it. It was part of who they were. My question to you this morning is, it the same for you and I? Is that a part of who we are, introducing others to Christ, sharing the good news of who Jesus is? Now, I know there's the old adage that, you know, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. But I'm telling you right now, just living your life is not going to be enough. Because there's a lot of people out there that are, are good people, so to speak, and don't have Jesus. You need to share the message of who Christ is. And the greatest message of who Christ is is what he's done in your life. You don't have to know the Bible to tell people about Jesus. All you got to do is tell people what Jesus has done for you. I didn't know the Bible when I first got saved, but man, I knew what God did for me. He, for the first time in my life, I felt loved. I felt free. Man, who doesn't want that? There's not one person on earth that doesn't want to be loved and free. Man, it was an easy message for me. I love these two disciples' hearts, sharing the love of Christ, and I pray the same thing for us this morning. Now, it's interesting that Philip is asked the question, right? But then after the question and and Philip's response, here comes Andrew alongside. And here's what I really believe, is that they had a special bond. In 1 John, we saw that they both were the first disciples to be called by Jesus, 
Both were from the same place. Both were from Bethsaida. And I believe they probably knew each other. They probably worshiped together as fellow Jews. And both of these guys had a passion to share Jesus with others. And so here comes Andrew alongside of his brother, and he provides an answer to the question asked by Jesus. There's something about a friendship that's built on Christ. It's different than any other relationship that you have. I look back through the 35 years that I've been walking with Jesus, and I've had some real squabbles with some brothers and sisters in Christ. But I'm telling you something, when you really, truly love Jesus, all that doesn't matter. Because you'll forgive each other, and you'll move on with each other. Right? We're human beings. We're not always going to interact in the, in the best interests of others. But in those moments when the relationship is, is strained or, or tattered, God will bring it back together because we're his kids. And Andrew and Philip had this unique friendship, I believe, and this unique bond. And they had a lot of similarities. And the second similarity is this is that both provided an answer that left out Jesus. Andrew chimes in. He says, look, this boy had five barley loaves and two fish. Now, real quick, the five barley loaves and two fish is interesting. These two items are mentioned. Barley was always regarded as a very simple food. It was more often fit for animals than it was for people. So this means that this young boy, he probably came from a very, very poor family. In the Talmud, which is the commentary on the written and oral Torah, there is a passage where one man says, there is a fine crop of barley. And the other man says, tell it to the horses and the donkeys, right? Barley was not something that people typically wanted to eat, yet... The barley is what is presented to Jesus by this young boy. John also mentions two small fish. Now, the other gospel writers, they use the ordinary word for fish in the Greek, which is ichthys, ichthys. But John here uses a different Greek word. He calls them asperia indicating that these two small, perhaps salted fish to be eaten, uh, they were eaten as a relish along with cakes or barley. Kind of like if you've ever had sardines, if any of you out here ever eat sardines, you take them, you kind of smash them down and grind them up and you put them on crackers and stuff like that. Kind of the same thought here. In essence, what's being presented here, the barley and the fish, is of, is of little significance. It's at the lowest of the food chain. Here's what you need to understand. There wasn't much to work with. But God doesn't need much, church. In fact, God doesn't need any help at all. Andrew appears to be bringing a solution to Jesus, knowing that Jesus will do something with it. However, that's not the truth. He brings a solution in the sense that he points out that there's these, these five loaves and two fish. But his next response tells us that he was in the same mindset as Philip. Look at what he says in verse 9. But what good is that with this huge crowd? So you come and you say, hey, look, here's a boy with five barley loaves and two fish. And then in the same breath, you say, but what good is it? So why even suggest it? No, Andrew suffered from the same thing. He suckered, suffered from a lack of faith. He saw with physical eyes and not spiritual eyes. In church, a lot of times we get in situations and we see things through the physical when we need to see things through the spiritual. I tell you all the time, anything that's manifested into the physical world first happens in the spiritual. That's biblical. 
Read it. It happens in the spiritual first. Andrew had seen the miraculous things Jesus had done. Just like Philip, he had seen it. He had seen the, the, the water turned into wine. He, he had seen the dead resurrected. He had seen the lepers healed. He had seen all of these things. Yet his response shows that he had a lack of faith in what God could do. If we take anything from last week and this week, take this. Let it be that God can accomplish what he wants no matter what the circumstance is, church. No matter what your circumstance is this morning, God can get you through it, and he will get you through it. Now, as we learned last week, Jesus was preparing and testing his uh, disciples for this miracle, right? But there's another element in all of this that I want to point out to you. God often deliberately restrains his work until he has our participation. See, here's what you need to understand. Jesus wanted his disciples' engagement in what he was going to do. And so, listen, Jesus, he could have just sat the disciples down. He could have just sat everybody down, pointed to the young boy, because it's not as if Jesus didn't know the young boy wasn't there. And he could have just done the miracle. In fact, he didn't even need the young boy. He could have just produced all the food that he needed to produce for this multitude just by speaking it. But no, Jesus wanted everyone's buy-in. Everyone's, including the little boy. Think of the impact on this young boy. Here he is with the five loaves and the two fish. And here is the master of the universe, the creator of life, who's going to take what he has in his hands, and he's going to feed a multitude of 20,000 people. Think of what that did to that young boy. How much his faith should have been increased in that moment. Jesus wanted everybody's participation. Everyone. He wanted to draw everyone in. And sometimes God will wait to do something till we're all in. Jesus knew that what was going to happen was going to have a tremendous impact on his disciples' lives. He knew by drawing them in and allowing them to participate in the decision, allowing them to participate in what was going to happen, one day they would be in similar circumstances, impossible situations, and they were going to be able to look back and draw on what Jesus had done and realize that that same drawing power that was there then would be with them now. Here's the thing. I think it's the coolest thing in the world that God lets us be involved in his work. And the problem is, church, is that a lot of us don't want to participate. We think coming here to the house of the Lord, that's the end all. And it's really just the beginning. This is where we should come to get reset for the week. I look forward to Sunday morning. Right? I mean, I look at this past week, I look at the things that I encountered, the difficulties that I had, the, the exhaustion that I was feeling. And when I come to church, I just get re-energized because I get to be with my brothers and sisters, man. And I get to reset. And then I get to step out of here better equipped and more prepared for what God has for me for the week. Church, every one of us are participants. And I'm going to drive this home to you through this whole message, this whole series. You're participants. And you need to seek God out every day and ask God, Lord, how do you want me to participate in your kingdom today? What do you have for me? Because he wants you to be involved in his work. He loves you so much. 
And so today as I close out, maybe you're lacking faith in a, in a situation. As I said earlier, have you ever been in a situation where the help of another made a difference? You know, on the surface, it, it may seem like Andrew wasn't much help to Philip. I mean, he really didn't provide a solution to the problem. His answer was really no better than Philip's was. But let me tell you what was so important about this. Andrew was there with him in that moment. He was there with them in that moment. And there's nothing better in life than when you're in a difficult moment than to have your brother or sister in Christ with you, man. There's nothing like it. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Maybe this morning you're struggling with a work that God is calling you to. And maybe you're not responding it responding to it in the right way. Maybe you feel inadequate or ill-equipped, and maybe, maybe you feel unusable this morning because of your past, whatever it is. God is bringing someone alongside of you for the moment that you're in to somehow bring about the results that are needed in your life. Church, two is always better than one. It's always better than one. What, is the, what does the Bible tell us? One can slay a thousand, two can slay ten thousand. So you're telling me that two of us can do ten times more than one. Yes, that's what God's saying. Jesus sent his disciples out in twos. He sent them out so they could support each other and encourage each other and be accountable to each other. And when one was feeling down or low, the other would be like, come on, man, we got this. Let's keep going, man. Let's stay in the game. Let's roll. He sends us another because he loves us. Because man was not meant to be alone. We were meant to have help, help church. And he sends us those to help us. And he sends us to help others. It's a beautiful picture of God's love. His extension of his love. Because he loves us so much, church. I think sometimes we forget how much God truly, truly loves us. It reminds me of the verse in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. It says, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you but will rejoice over you with singing. Think about that verse. This, this mighty warrior, this, this Lord your God, he's in the business of doing one thing, and that's to save us. It says he will take delight in you. Like, I think about this verse, and as I was dwelling on this verse, it reminded me of when my... My little baby granddaughter comes and sees me, right? She's not a baby anymore. She's five, right? But she has my heart. She has my heart. And I take great delight in her. Even when she comes over to my house crabby because she's got to go to school in the morning or whatever, I still take great delight in her. I love her. I love her so much. It says in this verse, verse that, God will rejoice over you with singing. And I can remember when she was little and holding her and singing to her. And I was rejoicing in my heart over this little baby girl that I was holding in my hands. God rejoices over you in singing. He sings over your life. Church, we come in here on Sunday mornings and we struggle to open our mouths and sing to God. We struggle. We don't want anybody to hear us singing. I can't sing. Who cares? We don't want to raise our hands. We don't want to have too much emotion because we're, we've got to be like this. No, we should be like God is over us. He rejoices over us with singing. But do we do the same thing when we come into the house of the Lord? No. No. 
God's response to us is to rejoice over us, singing beautiful, beautiful things to our hearts, minds, and souls, man. I truly believe that when I'm asleep at night, there have been times I have been so worn out and exhausted And I believe that God sent ministering angels to me to sing the sweetest things to me at night because my spirit and my soul would be so revived and so refreshed in the morning. And it isn't natural. It wasn't natural. That's how much God loves us, church. He will rejoice over you with singing. Oh, we have such an amazing Father that loves us so much. That so much desires us to participate in his work. This morning, he's inviting you. He's saying, come. Come. Let's do this together. My yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Together, we can accomplish this. Together, we can work miracles. Together, we can change people's lives. Together, we can feed 20,000. Together, we can eradicate homelessness. Together, we can do anything. But he, Jesus, or God is saying, I'm waiting for you to participate. And when you participate, then I'm going to move. Remember, the key element in anything is Jesus, church. He is the key element. If Jesus is in it, then believe it and do it. But we've got to let that element in. We've got to let Jesus into our lives. We've got to let the Holy Spirit be the one to guide us and direct us. Because the God in Zephaniah, who rejoices over us with singing, who loves us, with a love we can't understand, is extending his hand and saying, come, come with me. Together, we will change the world. And Lord, that's our prayer this morning. We want to be world changers, Lord, not for ourselves so that we can pound on our chest how great we are. But Lord, in humility, submit ourselves to you and glorify you in the work of your hands. I pray for my brothers and sisters today who are struggling, who are searching, who are doubting, who are fearing, Lord, that you would continue to rejoice over them with singing, that they will experience you taking delight in their lives, Lord, that you would wash over them with goodness and mercy and all the grace that you've summoned up, summoned up with the death of your son on the cross. I pray, Lord, today would be a new day for all of us, a new step, a new direction, and full participation, Lord, in the work you have. Thank you, Father. Bless us and keep us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.